Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. Um, in today's video we're going to be discussing the inorganic properties of different types of trace evidence. So thinking that there's a range of different um, types of evidence that a, a criminalist, a, a forensic scientist might encounter, um, and there's a, a range of different particular uh, pieces of information that might be useful. Okay, so there's some of the, the types that we're going to look at. We're going to start by looking at soil. Um, which is more, which is specifically referenced in the syllabus as an example, um, but we're also going to go through some other examples. Um, that is paint, glass, and fibres or hairs. And so we're going to go th um, go through some of the specific uh, bits of information that we might gather from looking at that. And um, we'll spend most of the time looking at soil, but we will um, outline some of these others too. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, so when we're thinking about soil from a forensic context, <clears throat> soil, along with other types of trace evidence, is really useful um, at being able to make connections between um, a crime scene, a victim, uh, a suspect or you know, potential perpetrator or witnesses, um, connecting a primary crime scene to a secondary or tertiary crime scene where, you know, say for example, someone is killed in one place and their body is dumped in another place and then um, the, the suspect, you know, disposed of evidence in a third place. Um, the soil comparisons can help to, to draw connections between these things. Um, it can also help in the reconstruction of events as far as looking at, at it as something that, that can transfer um, in, in, a, in a particular sequence. Um, and also, um, especially in things like tyres and on footwear impressions, that soil is often a mixture, that the soil we would be testing might be a mixture of soils, so that can, um, yeah, it can give us a, a range of information. Okay, so you can see here on the, some of the images that we've got here, you know, so our, our forensic scientist in their wonderful disposable PPE collecting soil samples near a crime scene, you know, some crime scene kind of photos looking at a soil sample on a, um, on a shovel, and then some, um, some samples kind of that have been collected. Okay, and so, um, yeah, so it's all that, about being able to, to look at the soil type and the, the unique characteristics of soil as a, a way to connect, um, connect things together. Okay, so one of the, the first sort of things that, that we would do for something like this is classic non-destructive technique and using microscopy, examining um, using a stereo microscope where we're looking with, with two lenses to get a 3D perspective um, to observe the characteristics of that soil sample. So identifying if there's any, you know, maybe insect activity or some organic material um, or other um, more specific or identifying kind of features that are, are that, that might be present in the soil. It might be to do with the, the surrounding area or the, the time of year or, or, you know, some particular kind of plant or animal matter that might be nearby. Maybe it's animal feces or who knows. Okay, it, it, it very much depends on the, the context. But being able to examine it with a microscope and identify its features and see what it looks like, see what you can find, is a classic first or, you know, an, an, an understandable first step. Okay, um, and so then we're also interested in, all right, well, how is that soil put together? What minerals does it contain? And so one of the ways that we can identify those, sorry, while well, I just adjust myself, um, is by using what's called polarised light microscopy. So actually using a special type of microscope that uses polarised uh, light, where, so, so, you know, typically the light that we're using is travelling in all kind of directions in, th in three dimensions. So polarised light um, filters out everything but light travelling in a particular plane. And what we, we do is that then we also look at, um, so this is like what a sun material made for sunglasses is, will do. Um, and then we can also have a, another kind of, um, so that we're, maybe we're filtering light that's going this way. And then we have another pane of, of polarizing material that will, will be at 90 degrees, so it will block everything. And what happens is that then that, you know, all, all things being equal, then the no light should get through. But sometimes if you put a material in between, um, like, a, like a crystal or a mineral, that it will actually um, twist the light in itself, or or a, a, a um, it's something called birefringence, and um, and what it will do then is that it means that some colours of light will actually get through, even though it's twisted because the light's been changed as a result, and so we can observe um, the minerals that might be present. Okay, we can also look at the size of the particles and as a way of classifying: is it silt? Is it clay? Is it mud? Is it loam? You know different types of, of soil that we might come across based on the size of the, the, the particles you can see like in this image down here. 
Um, we also want to look at the color and you know identifying any colored components using techniques that we can use to analyze color um, forensically as well, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit more in the paint section. Um, as well as also doing pH testing for acidity, we can look at measuring its hardness, so calcium and magnesium content. Okay, you know, we, and there are other wet chemical techniques we can do. We can also identify any um, organic material um, like humus, you know, so with the kind of the almost dirt material that we would be there, so it's still a, a little bit of the traces of the organic substances that it was. Okay, now let's have a quick, we're going to move on, we're going to have a look at paint. Okay, so very forensically useful. Um, and so there's, there's two kind of main components or main aspects to paint. Firstly, there's the bit that makes it coloured, uh, which might be a dye or a pigment, depending on the type of paint. With, you know, here we're talking about like auto paint, you know, like for a car, or it might be on a, a painted tool, or it might be house paint, or, you know, anything else that you could think of. Um, and then we also have the, the remaining um, complex mixture that goes into the paint, which helps to carry that coloured component. So it's got heaps of other different bits and pieces that kind of make the paint stick to surfaces, that they make it stick together, um, that they might make it moisture resistant or mould, you know, inhibit mould growth, or they might, um, you know, prevent rust formation if it's for a car, you name it, okay? There's heaps of different components in there, okay? And so, um, and we can also look at the layers of paint. So the coloured component, we can use techniques that actually um, measure the colour, um, you know, and what wavelengths of light it absorbs and reflects, and then use that to kind of um, characterise um, which paint it is. And that can lead back to a manufacturer, you know, and maybe even more specifically than that. Okay, but the paint layers is one of the most individuating aspects of um, looking at this. So looking at, say, like these two samples here, that the history of things like cars, that they're sprayed with particular layers of paint in a certain sequence, maybe certain, maybe it's been resprayed in its life, or there's been a touch-up kind of area, that the, the layers of the paint can be very distinctive. And so match, being able to, to match up the layers of the paint can lead back to an individual car, especially if the, the layers are very specific to that car, as opposed to more general um, to, to a, a particular model. Okay, and then you can see over here just some of the, the different components that might go into a layered paint chip. Okay, um, so the vehicle we can analyze using different laboratory techniques like chroma, um, gas chromatography, um, mass spectrometry, um, lots of different things. So the vehicle itself isn't colored, but it also contains lots of individual components that might be interesting. Okay, let's have a look at glass. Okay, so glass has a range of features that, that make it useful forensically, some which is class evidence and some which is more individual evidence. Okay, so fracture patterns or broken glass in particular is where we would be interested in. Okay, so th some more obvious things like the colour of the glass. Is it colourless or does it have a particular colour? Is it green or brown, like from bottle glass? Um, is it colourless, you know? Does that mean it's window glass? Does that mean that it's um, uh, auto glass, like tempered glass, um, which has got like, multiple layers to it? You know, is it from a, a drinking glass or, um, yeah, or for a safety, you know, safety glass window? Um, what's its density? So being able to actually make measurements of comparing um, different fragments in their density. And this is more of a, a comparative measure. So you get, you know, a sample, this sample and that sample, and you compare their densities relative to one another, um, as opposed to, because you're often dealing with very full, small fragments that are hard to quantify on their own. Um, we can also measure the refractive index um, of, of light. So the physicists out there, this would be a bit more familiar. Um, you've done this before, but looking at how the piece of glass refracts light and so to what extent depends. So it depends on the material, and it also allows us to distinguish glass from perspex and and other kinds of you know an acrylic, other um, you know glass-like materials that you know if it's a small fragment might be hard to distinguish otherwise. And then, you know, in looking at like the images that we have here, particularly this one down the bottom, that the fracture patterns that we that we see and the sequence in which fractures form um, also gives us useful information chronologically, you know, to see, okay, well, which, if we're looking at these as being perhaps bullet holes, we can identify, okay, well, which bullet hole formed first. So for example, this one on the left formed first um, because the fractures that come extend out of the one on the right stop at the point where um, this fracture already was existing. Okay, and then same thing, this is a, it butts into that.
Okay, and then a more individuating aspect of glass is physical fit. Do the can you fit the pieces back together into a particular place? Because that helps to identify not just a general kind of same type, but a common source. So seeing that these pieces do fit together like a jigsaw. Okay. Um, and then fibers, looking at um, so this this includes hairs as well, but also like material fibers from fabric. Okay, so what material is it made of? Is it natural like cotton or wool? Is it synthetic like acrylic or nylon um, or elastic? Okay, um, how is it woven together? What's its uh, we talk about its morphology or it's the appearance under a microscope? You can see like the morphologies over here are very distinctive. Okay, and also then. Does it have any coloured component to it? A dye that's specific, you know, we can measure its colour, we can measure its the chemistry of the dye. Um, that might trace back to a manufacturer or to a brand or um, to a particular type of material. You know, is it carpet fibres? Is it clothing fibres? Is it, um, yeah, is it from some other kind of cloth or, or something more specific or unique? Okay, so with these four types of evidence we've looked at, soil, um, paint, glass and fibres, that there's a range of different bits of information that we can, um, that can be forensically useful. Okay, I just, you don't need to know um, massive specific detail on each one, but in, in terms of being able to, to see how these different types of trace evidence um, can be useful, what particular properties that we can identify that um, might advance an investigation. All right, thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.